I, I think that uh, we are living in a, in a world and no thanks to media, which kind of, you know, thrives on saying how bad things are, which they are, you know, there's no question that they are. But uh, I think people are feeling a deep sense collectively, not even individually, of hopelessness. And through hopelessness comes sort of a retraction of socialization. So we're kind of living in, in, a, in a perfect storm, if you will, given that COVID-19 has kind of, you know, exacerbated uh, whatever xenophobia we've had pre-COVID-19. It's, just, it's, it's, it's now xenophobia on steroids. Uh, who's vaccinated? Who's not vaccinated? You know, why are you not vaccinated? And, you know, it's kind of like we're living in, in a, a medically induced xenophobia consciousness coupled to the previous social phobias that are really normal. I mean, people are, we're xenophobic because that's just part of our fear, our survival mechanisms that we've had to, to survive. But uh, it's a perfect storm right now. Welcome visionaries, creators, innovators, entrepreneurs, leaders, and growth seekers of all types to the Passion Struck Podcast. Hi, I'm John Miles, a peak performance coach, multi-industry CEO, Navy veteran, an entrepreneur on a mission to make passion go viral for millions worldwide. And each week I do so by sharing with you an inspirational message and interviewing high achievers from all walks of life to unlock their secrets and lessons to becoming passion struck. The purpose of our show is to serve you, the listener, by giving you tips, tasks, and activities you can use to achieve peak performance and pursue the passion-driven life you have always wanted to have. Now, let's become passion struck. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Passion Struck Podcast and Episode 75 with Dr. Jay Lombard. Thank you to all of you who come back each and every week to listen, learn, and grow with me on this show. We crossed a milestone this week of hitting over 1,600 five-star reviews on our goal of achieving 2000 by the end of this year. Now, let me introduce my guest and friend, Dr. Jay Lombard, who is an internationally renowned neurologist and author of several critically acclaimed books, including The Brain Wellness Plan, Freedom from Disease, and The Mind of God. In today's episode, we discuss his journey and why he became a neurologist is a collaborative approach to medicine, why he believes we need a team approach in healthcare. We go deep into his book, The Mind of God, where he tackles important questions like, does my life have purpose? What is the meaning of our existence? And how do you find belief? We also do an extremely deep dive into his research in finding alternative treatments for traumatic brain injury and how he and others are reversing terrible diseases such as ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. And we go through his underlying discovery that is helping him do just that. Such an amazing episode for you today. Now, let's become passion struck. I am absolutely stoked to have Dr. Jay Lombard on the Passion Struck podcast. Welcome, Dr. Lombard. How are you today? It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, I thought a great starting point would be to get your origin story for becoming a neurologist, because as we were talking about before the show, I have a, a daughter who's a senior in high school, and she is attending a medical magnet program, which has really instilled in her a desire to serve through medicine. And as we were talking, she went to a UCLA summer camp where she got exposed to everything from dentistry to different elements of medicine, et cetera. And she came out of that program with the desire to be a neurologist herself. So I'm always intrigued why doctors pick the given field that they go into. Yep. When I was 19 years of age, I was basically wanting to be a writer. I, I, I love writing and my, my fantasy was to be an author, which thank God I got to do in my life as well. For the time, my dad had a massive stroke and he went from being one of the most beautiful human beings alive. He was a kind hearted, very loquacious, very expressive person with a great sense of humor 
to a shell of his former self after the stroke, where he was unrecognizable. His personality had changed, um, his ability to even remember uh, things about me, he'd call me by my brother's name, was heart-wrenching as a 19-year-old. And I tried to understand all I could about how this man that was such a, a presence in my life went to being someone different that I didn't recognize before, uh, which really led me into wanting to study the brain more deeply. And that led me to go to medical school first and then to study neurology thereafter. Yeah. And there was a stint when you actually thought about becoming a psychiatrist. And so for you, it was just that inner sense that you could do more for people to treat them by being a neurologist. Was that what um, drove you to make that change? Well, it, the, the change, uh, I originally actually wanted to become, it's called a neurobehavioral neurologist. In fact, the first 10 years of my practice, I focused on what are called neurobehavioral diseases, which is the intersection of psychiatry and neurology. And, uh, you know, because of different circumstances, I ended up leaving that as my focus to do other research in other areas of medicine. But uh, those two years of psychiatry training never left me as far as sort of the understanding of the brain as being both a functional unit as well as a, as a hard drive unit. So the functional aspects of the brain are, are basically neurochemically mediated, but the hardware, if you will, is mediated by the structural aspects of the brain. So bringing those two things together has really been my philosophy of my practice. It wasn't like I made a decision not to pursue psychiatry. It was more of a decision to pursue neurology more deeply than psychiatry. Interesting. Uh, my cousin, I, I almost refer to him like an older brother, um, Art Berman, is a top psychiatrist in the D.C. area, and he's been teaching at Georgetown for a very long time, and he teaches residents their bedside manners and how to properly approach uh, patients. So interesting how far you can take psychiatry in different ways. Yeah, one thing, I used to, I used to train psychiatry residents when I was a, a neurology attending. And I would say that you need to have the same understanding about the neurochemistry of a psychiatric disease as a neurosurgeon has about the neuroanatomy of a brain disease. So I think that's kind of where uh, I see the intersection of neurology and psychiatry is having that very deep understanding of pathogenesis, both on a molecular level, but also a structural level. And getting back to you being an author, not only have you written a book, you've written many books. And I was hoping we could talk about a couple of them here. One is called The Brain Wellness Plan. Another one is called Freedom from Disease. And, and the one book that I just uh, purchased myself is called The Mind of God. And I want to get to The Mind of God last. So can you, for the listener out there, just give them a little teaser on The Brain Wellness Plan and Freedom from Disease? Sure. So the Brain Wellness Plan was the first book I wrote when I was out of my neurology residency and became an attending. And I was faced, as I am now, with patients with progressive neurological diseases, Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and others. And I said, there has to be, if, if nature has caused these problems, then there has to be things within nature that can address them. So uh, the book actually was very prescient, meaning that we spoke a lot about mitochondrial dysfunction in a variety of conditions. Uh, some of my early research was actually identifying uh, autism as a mitochondrial disease. So once you say, okay, well, if the mitochondria are dysfunctional, how do you repair them? You can't repair them. Well, now they're trying to repair them with you know, CRISPR and other technologies, but at the time we would use high doses of mitochondrial agents. Uh, like carnitine and others, which have since been shown to be very effective in a variety of clinical conditions. So the book was very, very early. I'll never forget, I, I once had one of my professors read the book and he goes, you know what, Jay? He goes, either you're too early or you're too late. So that book was, was, was way ahead of its time. Uh, in fact, I was offered to rewrite that book to update it because many of the things that, that we talked about uh, in that book were based upon using non-pharmacological interventions to help reduce the progression of neurological conditions. The, the second book, Freedom of Disease, Freedom from Disease, was actually reviewed by Mehmet Oz and also was kind of too early as opposed to being too late, meaning that there has been established that part of brain degeneration is due to insulin resistance, in which that the uh, receptors 
uh, in the brain particularly to metabolize glucose uh, become sort of insensitive, producing uh, an inability to metabolize glucose properly. And that actually leads to the, some of the cognitive deficits that have been associated with conditions like Alzheimer's disease. So those two books were really, really trade books. Mind of God was, uh, I was approached by the uh, editor uh, at Random House at the time. He said, you know, can you write a book on uh, the afterlife as from a neuroscience perspective? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I can't do that. But, uh, you know, do you have any other ideas in mind about what book I can write for you? So that was kind of the origins of that book. And uh, quite frankly, it's the book I'm most proud of. I feel that book really uh, is, is autobiographical, uh, but also it synthesized uh, a lot of my ideas about faith not being incongruent with science. We think that science somehow negates faith, you know, and that's to me, it's just the opposite. Our, our brains are actually hardwired for faith. So faith has uh, a built in mechanism that we all require. And just, you know, clinically, I could tell you that the patients I've experienced with neurodegenerative diseases like ALS, uh, who never lose their sense of purpose and faith, have a much longer survival uh, than those that have given up uh, either on their faith or their purpose of their lives. So faith and purpose are, are biologically mediated. And that's what the book is about. Yeah. So one of the, the core things about the book is the need to focus your beliefs in a positive direction. And what are some of the things that studying patients and, and creating this book you found about that component right there? How do, how do you shift your beliefs in a positive direction? Huh. It's a very hard question to, to answer because each person has sort of their own set of challenges in their life that require to reflect on those challenges as being meaningful, uh, as opposed to being uh, random. It's kind of the nature of disease uh, to be random, right? I mean, uh, why do some people get ALS? Some people don't get ALS, they get another condition. Uh, and when you're struck with one of these diseases, you're really struck by sort of the cruelty of the disease itself. You know, ALS is a horrible disease to actually witness at any level, whether you're a physician taking care of those patients uh, or a family member. And as a disease progresses, one of the things that very often happens is that people just, they give up hope. And it's, it's sort of the, uh, I think, the one nugget of advice that I would have, because my research is on biology of ALS, but clinically, I could tell you that the people that, that have the best chance of surviving ALS are those that have not let go of their purpose and see ALS as a challenge as opposed to a death sentence. Okay. And I wanted to explore this point a little bit more. So you know, for you, the metaphysical questions that you address in the book are kind of a jumping off point for what I thought was exploring the brain and you know, your words would be in the seat of the soul. And I was hoping you could unpack that a little bit. I love, great question. So it's a fantastic question. Uh, so let me tell you about one of the cases that I wrote about in the book to answer that question. So uh, back when I was doing behavioral neurology, 15 years ago, um, I saw a child, uh, not a child, an adolescent who uh, had a dramatic change in his behavior pre and post a neurosurgical procedure in which they put a shunt in for something called hydrocephalus. Before the procedure, he was just a, a regular kid, had problems with his, his gait, his ambulation. Uh, Post-surgery, he became uh, well, he was classified as a sociopath. He did some very, very aberrant behavior that led him to be arrested for something that he had done at school that uh, it's not even worth talking about. And he had, you know, routine evaluations by psychiatrists. And they said, yeah, he's incorrigible, should go yeah. to whatever. And the mom ended up consulting me. And we did what's called a, a DTI image. Now, DTI is a new type of MRI scan that actually looks at the flow of water in the brain. Hmm. So, you know, the brain, we think of the brain as being sort of like this, you know, in a desert, but the brain is surrounded by water, you know, both externally, you know, the cerebral spinal fluid, but also internally, there are all these uh, pathways that are like aqueducts uh, that take, you know, fluid from one area of the brain 
uh, to other areas of the brain that, that you normally can't see on you know, typical CAT scan or radiographical studies. At the time, this was back, I think, in uh, early 2000, a type of MRI called DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, uh, was able to actually identify these particular uh, tracks in the brain. And when we did the study, we showed that there was a, a, a significant interruption of these t- tracks of water in areas of the brain that mediated uh, executive function, function, frontal lobe function. So it was very clear that this was an anatomical issue that led to a behavioral issue, as opposed to being a behavioral issue that was the primary cause of his, of his misbehaviors. Um, now, to answer your question, What's interesting about diffusion tensor imaging studies is that when you do them uh, and you're looking at at consciousness, right? So people have studied consciousness through imaging studies and they've demonstrated that uh, in consciousness itself, there's an area of the brain called the default mode network, which is kind of like the ego. It's kind of what defines Jay Lombard as Jay Lombard. It's kind of what defines you as you. They've done studies in depression, in schizophrenia and all sorts of TBI patients to look at diffusion tensor imaging in normal controls versus patients who are affected by psychiatric diseases. And one can see actually these defects or interruptions in the flow of of the circulation of water in the brain. One of the discoverers of this technology is is a professor named Dr. Demedian, who actually discovered MRI scans back in the 70s. Uh, I just met him recently, a couple of months ago. It's an amazing story that I I won't go into right now, but he's a very religious person. And we were talking about DTI studies. And I said to him, I said, you know, DTI is the closest we're going to get to identifying, you know, what we call the soul or the, or the ethers as uh, Isaac Newton once called the soul as these kind of ethers that were unmeasurable. But the fact that we now have state-of-the-art imaging we can see the, not just the structure of the brain, but the flow of these networks. It's the closest I think we come to the analogy of the idea of the, that the tree of life, if you will, that the brain is not just the leaves and the flowers, but the water that flow from the roots to enliven the brain. Once those stop, there's no more life. Very interesting. What a fascinating topic and what a great reason to read your book. And I will make sure It's in the show notes where people can find it. Now, I originally discovered you because I heard your interview with Tom Bilyeu, and I originally reached out to you seeking guidance on how we could help um, a veteran. And the interesting thing- All veterans. um, All veterans. All veterans. Well, and that's kind of where I'm going with this is uh, as we talked, I had combat- related trauma and sports injury trauma that resulted in a number of traumatic brain injuries. And there have been a number of things since those have occurred that have altered how I feel inside. When you get, you lose focus, you have short-term memory issues, you have irritability and the list goes on. And where I wanted to go with this is um, I thought I was alone and I was going through this alone and what I was facing is when I went to both the civilian doctors and also the VA, they tend to operate in a set of protocols. So when I went to a civilian neurologist, first they want to do a sleep study, then he did an EEG, then he did an MRI, then he did a CT, which all were inconclusive. So then he went down the route of uh, doing, a, doing a neuropsych eval. And at the VA, it was a little bit different, but what both showed me is that no one is really looking at the person holistically. What is at the root cause here? Now, what I have found since then is that there are hundreds of veterans who are just like me, many of them uh, coming out of the special forces community who all have almost 90% overlap in our symptoms. And I know you're working on a theory now about if you've had a traumatic brain injury, um, how you can possibly treat that, uh, which leads to also potentially the treatment of Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's, and other things. Yep. And I, you know, I was hoping you could cover this from two perspectives. You know, why is medicine treating this in, in such a compartmented way when, you know, DTI and 
more advanced MRI technologies have been the only proven thing that I've seen that can really diagnose long lasting brain injuries. And then I forget what you called it, but uh, you said what ends up happening is there becomes a blockage between kind of your spinal system and your brain that needs to be flushed because things are stuck. So I was hoping you could cover both aspects of this. Sure. So that was a very good um, overview. I don't even need to speak anymore since you kind <laughs> of uh, <laughs> summed it so nicely yourself. What happens during uh, traumatic brain injury is that uh, proteins that are, that are normally three-dimensional, right? So every protein in our body are, are three-dimensional structures. They're not two-dimensional. When we read about them, we kind of envision them as, as sort of chemicals that lack a three-dimensional structure. But the problem is that all proteins are actually three-dimensional, which means that uh, severe impact injuries affect these proteins and they become what's called misfolded proteins. So think of like an origami that your dog actually you know, chews up or steps on. So after traumatic brain injury, uh, these misfolded proteins occur in proximity to where that injury actually occurred. They're called shearing injuries or, or counter, counter coup injuries. And you can't see them obviously on any type of scanning. The, the only way that you know that they're there uh, is unfortunately through autopsy studies. So, you know, I started looking at uh, all the uh, autopsy studies of patients with traumatic brain injuries. And sure enough, they, they all have the same pathological proteins that associate with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, amyloid, alpha-synuclein, and TDP43, meaning that there's a direct connection between the development of pathological proteins and traumatic brain injury, as opposed to the leading theory, which is, oh, it's just genetic, meaning that, you know, if you have these genes, that's what produces these misfolded proteins. So- Well, uh, well so I just want to stop there, because that, I mean, that's a huge finding. It's a huge be finding, be yes. Because everything I have been told through medicine is that it's more genetic, but my fear has been that there is a link between brain injury and, you know, long-term potentially experiencing some of these other conditions that can come as a result of it. So that there, there is a genetic link, meaning that, that people with certain genes may have a more, a higher propensity to develop these types of conditions, but most of the, um, the monogenetic causes of, of ALS are differentiated from what's called sporadic causes. We really don't know what the driving etiology is for sporadic forms of, of ALS, uh, but the major one risk factor is traumatic brain injury. I mean, that's published data. I mean, you could read that anywhere that that's the, the highest association of risk factors. People talk about other risk factors, whether they're environmental exposures, cigarette smoking, going down the list, but, but TBI, uh, as well as cervical injuries, have a higher rate of developing motor neuron disease, uh, which is a better terminology than ALS, because ALS kind of puts you into this kind of, you know, death spiral of a diagnosis. And I think motor neuron disease is a better description than ALS for these conditions. But going back to your question, so once those, those proteins become misfolded, right, it's the, the brain's responsibility to housekeep. There's a whole sanitation department of the brain that has to first recognize uh, where these pathological proteins are, and then to kind of say, okay, that's a bad protein. Let's take it to the recycling plant. And then from the recycling plant, let's take it back into the river going downstream so it can get out of the brain. We don't want it to go up into the brain. We want to actually take it downstream. That neurological system is called the glymphatic system, which was uh, discovered by researchers um, uh, here in New York. I think Dr. Nettergaard uh, first discovered these uh, glymphatic units. Uh, I think she's from Rochester, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but the glymphatic unit is named that way because it's a combination of glial cells, which are the white blood cells of the brain, with lymphatics. So at one time people believed, oh, there was no such thing as a lymphatic system in the brain. But now that we've identified that there is, uh, we've now been able to correlate that that system that is responsible for the housekeeping to remove these misfolded proteins is defective. It's like the it's like the, the all the sanitation department wants a raise and they're you know they're going on strike and all this garbage accumulates, such as these pathological proteins like TDP forty three and others. So then, how do you go about flushing it? Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> well, now that's that's an interesting question, right? So it's funny when I gave my I, I gave one TED Med talk, which, you know, kind of put me on the stage of being an infamous or thought leader in neurology as being sort of a contrarian, right? Uh, which is okay. I don't, I don't mind sort of being considered that. But during, during my, my talk at TED Med, and this was back in 2012, it's a funny anecdote I'll tell you later about that as well. Because uh, my daughter, who was six at the time, uh, attended it. And she's like, Dad, how come like no one, you know, either clapped or or even understood what you were talking about? Like, I'm, I'm like oh, thanks, Sophia, you know, really appreciate encouragement. Kid. But what I said in that talk was that when we're able to identify the specific biomarkers uh, associated with neurodegenerative diseases, then we actually are able to identify what types of treatments may actually be mostly effective for them. Until we get to that point, which we hadn't even gotten close to in 2012, the conditions that are diagnosed clinically until you have symptoms that are overt for dementia or ALS. Oh, you know what? Maybe you weren't depressed. You know, maybe this was the early symptoms of degeneration, but we didn't have the availability to identify those technologies then as we do now. Uh, so people are now identifying uh, the ability to visualize the glymphatics and have been associated with a accumulation of these pathological proteins like amyloid and, and TDP43 in vivo, I mean, not just waiting for autopsies and saying, oh, you know what? Um, yep, you were right, Dr. Lombard. My lymphatic system was totally screwed up. Uh, so my, my point is that the ability to identify those in real time uh, opens up the possibility to do what you just labeled as, you know, flushing the system. So the question is, how do you flush the system, right? Well, first of all, you have to do like, you know, if, if your sewer line is backed up, you call the plumber and they put those devices in. You know, we once had one of those where they go in there and they, you know, look at, oh, you know, the, your daughter didn't flush the toilet paper properly. Like, let's let's scoop it out kind of thing. So it's, it's kind of the same thing where we are right now in medicine, uh, meaning that there are three or four technologies that are currently being assessed. Now, this is very early clinical. So I don't want to tell you that this is the answer, but I believe one day it will be the answer. But there's research that if you uh, give what's called low intensity ultrasound to various areas of the brain, that you're able to actually open up the blood brain barrier and literally, you know, flush those protein aggregates down the proverbial toilet bowl into the CSF. Uh, the researchers that are doing that, one of them is Michael Caplet, uh, who's at New York Hospital. He's what's called a functional neurosurgeon. So it's interesting that a lot of these technologies, I would love to say that they're being you know, created by neurologists because I'm a neurologist, but actually this field has really been opened up by neurosurgeons that have identified this through radiographical methods and developing strategies like ultrasound. Uh, to be able to get rid of uh, these pathological proteins. There's an early study they did with Alzheimer's patients. Uh, it was a small sample size, but it was an open label study. They were able to demonstrate not only the ability to flush out amyloid from the brain, amyloid being the pathological protein associated with Alzheimer's disease, but they, they correlate it with an improvement in patient's cognition. So that's a huge, huge finding. And I think this is gonna be the wave of the future. I really do. That is extremely fascinating because not only could it help with Alzheimer's patients or early onset of dementia, but potentially it could help TBI, people who, yeah. CT, CTE. CTE. So if a person um, who's listened to this was feeling the early onset of something like dementia or Alzheimer's, what would be your advice to them? Where, where can they go today since this is all um, in clinic? I, I, would, I, would, I would recommend that they uh, go to a center of excellence, depending on what state they would live in. So for instance, in, in, uh, in New York, uh, both Columbia and New York Presbyterian Hospital have experts that, that focus on neurodegenerative diseases, including early Alzheimer's disease. And usually they have a team approach, meaning they have you know, neurologists and neurosurgeons that hopefully evaluate those patients. Usually they first start with neurology and in many of these centers of excellence, they do do DTI studies uh, where potentially at other centers that don't have centers of excellence, uh, 
may not perform those kinds of studies. So I think, you know, getting the proper imaging is an important thought that people should have when being concerned about these conditions. Interesting. Well, I think I mentioned to you when we talked uh, before that a couple months ago, I interviewed uh, Dr. Michael Lewis, um, who was asked to, for a period of five to seven years, try to get to the bottom of TBIs and how can, we never discuss the methods that you're talking about, but how can patients recover from these? And he he told me that one of the common findings that they found was that all those who experience TBIs and also the majority of people who are suicidal have extremely low levels of omega-3s. And I was wondering if this is something that you've ever heard about, or if you could see where that linkage could take form. That's, first of all, that's a great point that he brought up. I'm hoping actually that to potentially speak to him uh, at some later date, because, um, you know, he's very active working with a lot of, a lot of veterans that have had TBIs. So uh, a lot of the early data, uh, in fact, I mentioned this in my, my first book, The Brain Wellness Plan, ironically, 1995, uh, was that omega-3 fatty acids are uh, compounds that have been demonstrated to be lower in depressed states, not just from TBI, but just depression, bipolar disease, even uh, schizophrenia. And the mechanism is that when you have disruption of cell membranes, right? So that's what happens in, in TBI cases is that the, the reason the protein becomes misfolded is because the cell membrane uh, that normally is the protector between the extracellular environment and the intracellular environment breaks down. And it breaks down because of certain enzymes called lipases. One is called phospholipase, which actually leads to a breakdown of these membranes. So the idea that you can rebuild these membranes, not only through omega-3 fatty acids, but other phospholipid supporting agents So there's data on uh, phosphatidylserine, uh, which is one of the phospholipids that's that's important uh, in the brain. Also uh, phosphatidylcholine, which is another uh, very important cell membrane. The concept is that you wanna rebuild those cell membranes so that they become more flexible to allow for a proper signaling of neurotransmitters that otherwise become defective as a result of a deficiency of those omega-3 fatty acids. Very interesting. So is that why um, there are other people who are looking into also using hormone therapy to potentially treat TBIs or is that a completely- So that that, that data is interesting. So they've looked at um, giving, so so there's two issues with, with hormone therapies as there are with anything else in TBI. There's acute TBI and then there's chronic TBI. And their mechanisms of action are different, meaning that in acute TBI, you're in a a pro-inflammatory state. Um, The idea of progesterone, uh, which has been looked at clinically as being a potential uh, amelioration of traumatic brain injury patients. I don't know where that data is at this point because I've not looked at it recently, but I could tell you that for chronic TBI patients, what I'm looking at, and not just for chronic TBI patients, but patients with uh, ALS and, and uh, dementia and even Parkinson's disease is understanding the following, which is that the first process in getting rid of those pathological proteins, the misfolded proteins that occur after traumatic brain injury that are also associated with Alzheimer's, ALS, and Parkinson's disease occurs in the cell, right? And it occurs within the cell in this acid vat called the lysosome. And think of the lysosome as a, as a boiling water that you want to cook chicken into, right? If that, if that water is not boiling hot enough, you put this, this, this chicken uh, into it, and then you tend to eat it, you're going to get a very severe infection. So what, the recent, what recent research has shown that in chronic TBI patients, there's a defect in the lysosome, I meaning the lysosome is not hot enough. So people are looking at ways of making the lysosome hotter, if you will, to potentiate its ability to break down these pathological proteins. So it's, it's kind of like sort of the reverse idea that you need to reduce inflammation in the brain. And I'm not saying that you don't need to reduce inflammation in the brain, but you have to do both. You have to reverse inflammation in the brain while increasing the brain's capacity to break down these pathological proteins so that you don't get glymphatic backflow. 
very interesting and a lot that, to, to take is, in. Is that, is that, I'm sorry, because I, you know, is that too technical because I could try to break no, down? No, 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 it's, it's not too technical for me. It's just interesting um, how many of these different treatments overlap or need to work together. Yes. In, <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've always talked about the need to take a holistic or integrative approach to all these conditions, because, you know, fundamentally, what I think people are beginning to realize is that our current thinking about putting ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and CTE in separate silos doesn't work, because these diseases share in common very fundamental mechanisms that involve both the formation and the reduced degradation of these bad proteins across all these diagnostic boundaries. So I think what we need to kind of understand is that these are dimensional diseases. They're not categorical. You know, it's, okay, you have Alzheimer's disease, take Aricept and Nemenda. Oh, you have Parkinson's disease, take, you know, Cinemet and the latest, you know, dopamine agonist. You have ALS, take Rilatec and Radicava. I think we need a, a deeper understanding uh, that these diseases are united by very fundamental pathogenic mechanisms that are in common. Because until we get to that point, we're never going to adequately treat these conditions based upon their root cause of being related to traumatic brain injuries and the, the reduction in the ability of the brain to properly handle those pathological proteins going forward. Yes, very intriguing. And for the listener who might not understand how prevalent chronic uh, traumatic brain injury is, the last CDC report said that there are 5.5 million uh, people just in America alone living with it. And that's uh, only the ones who've been diagnosed, not not those who've had one and who, you know, have not been treated for it. So it it is a, a real thing and uh, affects a lot of people. Now, I was going to take this conversation in a completely different direction. Earlier, we were talking about consciousness, and there have been a growing number of studies some from Gallup, some from Harvard Business School, some from Forrester, you know, you name it, that more and more of society is becoming disengaged. In fact, mm -hmm. a Gallup poll of a billion full-time workers found that only 15% of them are engaged. And at the same time, in almost all Western countries, there's been a significant drop over the past two decades of business vitality, meaning the creation and turnaround of new businesses and entrepreneurship. And you know, people want to put put it on student debt, et cetera. But my own conclusion is I think that there are three contagions that are impacting society right now. And I, I say that they're apathy, comfort, and ego said otherwise, the contagions of the human mind, spirit, and self-importance. And I think that there are a whole bunch of people who are in a state that I call of choicelessness because they're in denial about uh, where they're living. And I have kind of grouped this into two different parallels. I think there are a whole bunch of people who are subsisting in life, meaning they're in survival mode. And I believe on the other side of that spectrum are, are more people like you, Tom Bilyeu is examples who are creators. And to me, one of the biggest differentiation points that I'm seeing is those who are subsisters who are in the survival mode are kind of casually engaged, meaning they're engaged by going through just the normal motions of life. And those who are on this other side of the spectrum who are creators are more consciously engaged, meaning they're present in the moment, they're intentful, they're purposeful in what they're doing. And that chasm from my perspective, is only growing, especially when we're in this world now where there's such an emphasis on what appears urgent versus what's truly important. And I, I led into that in a big way because I just wanted to get your perspective on it, especially from some of the previous books you've written. You know, it's funny that you asked that question. I was literally thinking about this yesterday, literally. And I think that I would replace apathy with the word nihilism. I think that uh, we are living in a, in a world and no thanks to media, which kind of, you know, thrives on saying how bad things are, which they are, you know, there's no question that they are. 
But uh, I think people are feeling a deep sense collectively, not even individually, of hopelessness. And through hopelessness comes sort of a retraction of socialization. So we're kind of living in, in, a, in a perfect storm, if you will, given that COVID-19 has kind of, you know, exacerbated uh, whatever xenophobia we've had pre-COVID-19. It's, just, it's, it's, it's now xenophobia on steroids. Uh, who's vaccinated? Who's not vaccinated? You know, why are you not vaccinated? And, you know, it's kind of like we're living in, in a, a medically induced xenophobia consciousness coupled to the previous social phobias that are really normal. I mean, people are, we're xenophobic because that's just part of our fear, our survival mechanisms that we've had to, to survive. But uh, it's a perfect storm right now. And you add to it the overindulgence on digital media and its inability to communicate in a way that, that nature designed for us to communicate, uh, which is face-to-face -face or, you know, in this case, you know, thanks to Zoom, at least we're, we're having the ability of face-to-face. -face. I mean, I, I find my own self, uh, including my, my own family, that our communication, like my daughter will be upstairs and she'll like text me, you know, dad, what's for dinner? I'm like, you're upstairs. Can't you walk downstairs and, and just say, you know, what do you want for dinner, dad? But that's the world we're living in right now. And that, that if you magnify that type of communication on a global scale, what we're seeing is a deterioration, both in our, in our ability to judge, because we're judging things by words, not by direct presence. And we're also judging with our limbic system, which is always about, is there fear or threat? as opposed to the frontal lobes, which exist basically to say, okay, this is not a threat. So we are really, you're right, it's a growing chasm. And my concern is that chasm is gonna, unless we figure out a, a way forward, can only deepen, which is very worrisome to me as a thought leader, because I'm concerned about the future of this world. <laughs> you know, to be very honest, I am. Well, it's interesting that uh, you brought up that communication because that's exactly what my 17 year old wants to do is just text me from upstairs in her bedroom. And the way we were designed to communicate was face to face, or, you know, I call it the transactional modal communication because there's a give and take between two people who are present together. And so much of communication today is being replaced by electronic means. And the biggest issue you run into is, is oftentimes the intent behind what anyone is saying. So I, I, I way, you know, it's interesting. Uh, back when I was uh, wanting to think about my next book after mind of God, I was thinking about writing a book called brain drain and to show not just theoretically, but to show through studies, how digital media, the internet, everything, everything else has really affected the structure, not just the function, but the structure of the brain. And one example I gave to the editor, the book never got written, obviously, because otherwise uh, I'd be promoting that book right now. But our reliance on GPS comes to the point where like my wife will be driving home from like a neighbor's house and she'll put the GPS. I go, don't you know where we live? Like you don't need the GPS. She goes, oh, I just, I just like having it. But what, what our reliance, and I'm not saying GPS is bad or good. It's, it's really technology is really about how we use it. Technology is not inherently good or bad. It's how we actually mobilize technology that is. But the, our over-reliance on GPS literally produces atrophy in our parietal lobes, which are the way that we get spatial orientation. You know, spatial memory, we're kind of dissolving that over history because we're saying, okay, well, I don't have to remember where I live. I got this GPS device that's going to tell me how to get home. Or phone numbers or anything else. Wow. Phone numbers, wow. right. Wow, that's crazy. It's kind of, you know, we unfortunately become slaves of our technology. We really have, you know, and it's, uh, if I had to make one recommendation for the world, it would be that everybody take a, a digital day off, you know, one day, whether it's Saturday or Sunday, just to go digitless. And I think that would create uh, a pretty significant change in consciousness uh, because people will be forced to communicate, you know, by going to, you know, temple or to church or picnics with their family, as opposed to just being on their phone all day long. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a movie uh, my daughter got me to watch with her called Ready Player One, I think is the name of it. And it's this futuristic world where 
people are so hopeless in the real world that they all exist in a game. And yeah. the end story is someone eventually wins the game um, and gets to take control. And what they decide to put in place are, are that you can only play the game. I think it's three days during the week and the rest of it, um, you have to live your life because people were getting too consumed with it. And I, I think there's a huge point to be learned there. And by the way, that's not, that's not a science fiction movie. That is what's happening in the real world. I mean, you have people doing virtual sex right now, uh, all sorts of really bad things that uh, are replacing consciousness since we brought the topic consciousness requires a, a vessel, right? It requires the body, right? Uh, to be conscious means to feel with your body, with your eyes, with your mouth, with your ears, with your skin. Uh, when we take away the physical substrate of consciousness and immerse ourselves completely in a virtual world, uh, we may think we're conscious, but we're actually we're really not conscious. We could say, oh yeah, of course I'm conscious, you know, but that's a different level of consciousness than what we know about the true meaning of consciousness, which is the interface of our physicality with our, our mind, not our mind in a vacuum. So uh, I have to watch that movie, I maybe very <laughs> you know, alarmed by it. It was a very entertaining movie, you know, made for kind of a younger uh, audience, but uh, I think the points were still point on. Well, I, I was intrigued in the conversation we got into um, and your words, nihilism or, or hopelessness, because I formed passion struck because I felt I was being called to do it. In fact, whether you believe in God or a spiritual being, I was told you need to start helping the underdogs. And I kind of questioned, you know, what is the underdogs? And I, I got the answer that they're people who are underdogs in their own life. They're beaten, broken, bored, battered. And all of that is really hopelessness. And so that's kind of how I came up with how do you go from being passion stuck to passion struck? Because that's really what uh, the change is. How do you go from being hopeless to so passionate about what you're doing that you're willing to risk it all to go after it, which are two completely different dimensions. So Thank you for that. It kind of uh, is confirming my own my own thoughts on this whole movement I'm trying to do with Passion Struck. I, first of all, I love it, and and God bless you for doing it, and uh, you know God bless you for getting the message out there. That I once posted something that got a lot of likes and dislikes. That I said that false hope is an oxymoron. Oxymorons mean that that when you put two words together, they have opposite meaning. Uh, there's, there's no such thing as false hope. Very uh, poignant point. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Dr. Lombard, if um, a listener would like to get a hold of you, what are some ways that they can do that or, or more about your research? Sure. So I have uh, two emails I'm happy to give out. One is a personal email and one's uh, uh, my email for my medical practice. Or should I just give out my website? What would be better? For I, I'd, probably, well, I'd probably do website or if you okay. are socially anywhere, maybe those. Sure. So it's uh, my website. Uh, it's under construction. So, but it's www.drjaylombard.com. And that has my office phone number. It has uh, my direct phone number. Uh, it also has my direct email address. So if people want to, you know, reach me, uh, that's how they can do it. Okay, great. And so I thought I would just conclude by asking you in all these years of treating different patients as a neurologist, what has been the most, most unique case that you've ever run, run into, if you're able to share that. Unique. <laughs> so the book I wrote, Mind of God, was really like an Oliver Sacks kind of book. So if, I don't know if your audience is familiar with Oliver Sacks. He was a neurologist that wrote, his first book was The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. He talked about all these altered perceptions of patients that had neurological injuries and what kind of behavior it led to. So my book was kind of like an Oliver Sacks book, except the, what I kind of tried to explore was the what happens to issues of, of faith and consciousness as a result of traumatic brain injuries or psychiatric problems or whatever else like that. So probably the most intriguing case uh, of my career, by the way, made me switch from psychiatry to neurology. Uh, was a woman. I was uh, a resident at the time 
uh, in a psychiatric emergency room in an inner city hospital in, in New York on Christmas. And uh, never a good time to, to be on call in a, in a psychiatric emergency room because you get you know people that are drunk or suicidal. You know, it's just not the right day to pick. But of course I liked emergencies. Uh, so I picked that date and they brought in a woman, like four NYPDs and EMS, a woman that was like five foot three. And uh, she was like literally buckling the stretcher she was on. And she was, her, she was flailing, her, her head was going back and forth, like in, in rapid kinds of ways. And uh, so her husband was with her. And, you know, I tried to get a history, like, you know, when did your wife become like that? And he, he told me that uh, she was involved in an exorcism that had gone wrong, that they didn't. So she was still like in this, you know, uh, state where she believed that she was, you know, like like a totally evil woman. And I was so scared because this woman was like, you know, five, three. But she was the, the NYPD and the EMS were standing so far back from her, you know, and normally these guys have no fear. You know, they're like the Navy SEALs of, of uh, civil service. They were so scared that they were like hiding behind me. Like, I'm like, wait a second. Like, I got to examine her. You know, I need you guys here. Like, oh, no, no, doc. You know, <laughs> we'll stay in the corner. Uh, but we gave her medication and the medication worked. And uh, like two hours later, she was like the most docile woman you could ever imagine and, and had no recollection of, of, of her experience uh, in this regard. So she was diagnosed with a dissociative disorder based upon her history. And my attending at the time uh, decided to hypnotize her uh, to see if, if he can go back into the state that she was in during this, this botched exorcism to see if he can actually, you know, exercise her through, through psychotherapy as opposed to spiritual exorcism. And I'm like, you sure this is a good idea? Like, I don't know if this is a really good idea or not. I read about this in the book where you know, he's going, listen, you know, relax. You know, no one's going to hurt you here. I want to speak to your other self. She had given it a name. I forgot what the name was. And all of a sudden, within like 30 seconds, she transformed into the same personality that I had seen in the ER, like, you know, a week earlier on Christmas Eve. And it was such a violent transition, violent, that wow. uh, the whole room just kind of like moved all the way to, you know, to another corner of the room until the psychiatrist was able to kind of abort the hypnotic session, and bring her back to who she was. When I saw that experience, I was like, okay, so I get this is a psychiatric problem, but what, what ability does the brain and mind have to switch from this very loving personality to this absolute monster. Like what, what are the, what were the precursors that led her to have this personality disorder? Uh, and secondly, what were the biological substrates that could literally change your, your Mac computer to go to Dell or, you know, Hewlett Packard, like that it was that dramatic, like the entire hardware and software completely changed. That was the point where I decided that I, I need to study the brain more than just uh, the, the functionality of the brain, but the, the biochemistry of the brain. So that's probably my most memorable case of my career was that case, which I wrote about in, in the book. I, I kind of wish I would ask that first. What a fascinating story. We could talk well, about Dr. it more offline if you want. <laughs> well, Dr. Lombard, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today on the Passion Struck Podcast. Really appreciate it. It's really my pleasure. Thank you. What a great interview with Dr. Lombard. And I wanted to highlight some other interviews that we have done in the past and coming up also on traumatic brain injury. One of these was with Dr. Michael Lewis, and we talked about his amazing research he did for over five years when he was in the military at Walter Reed on the impact of having omega-3s on both traumatic brain injury and in reducing suicide rates. I also recently had on just last week, former NFL pro ball cornerback, Sean Springs, where he does a deep dive into Winpact, his company that is providing technology and data on how to reduce traumatic brain injury in sports, in leisure activities, and everything in between. And I have an upcoming interview with former Green Beret, 
Andrew Marr, who tells his story of the personal impact that traumatic brain injury had on him and why he founded the Warrior Angels Foundation, one that you're not going to want to miss. And his episode on The Joe Rogan Show has had four to five million downloads, so you're not going to want to miss it. Thank you, as always, for listening and watching the Passion Struck Podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and are able to apply the lessons to help you become passion struck. Thank you so much for joining us. The purpose of our show is to make passion go viral. And we do that by sharing with you the knowledge and skills that you need to unlock your hidden potential. If you want to hear more, please subscribe to the Passion Struck podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts at. And if you absolutely love this episode, we'd appreciate a five-star rating on iTunes and you sharing it with three of your most growth-minded friends so they can post it as well to their social accounts and help us grow our Passion Struck community. If you'd like to learn more about the show and our mission, you can go to passionstruck.com where you can sign up for our, our newsletter, look at our tools, and also download the show notes for today's episode. Additionally, you can listen to us every Tuesday and Friday for even more inspiring content. And remember, make a choice, work hard, and step into your sharp edges. Thank you again for joining us. 